Good morning. My name's Andy. If I haven't met you, the joy of the risen Jesus be yours. It's time for the Bible reading. Uh, we have some church Bibles if you would like one to follow along from. So please put up your hand uh, if you'd like a church Bible. And um, we've got, Alan's got some, I've got some here as well. Here we go. Our Bible readings today are from, firstly, the book of Job in the Old Testament. Uh, on, in our church Bibles, it is on page 414. Um, in your own Bibles, it's just before the Psalms and Proverbs. Job 19, verses 23 to 27. Starting at verse 23. Oh, that my words were recorded, that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. The second reading is from John's Gospel, John chapter 20, page 881 in the Church Bibles. John 20, verses 24 to 31. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Thanks, Andy. If we haven't met before, my name's David, and I'm the pastor here. Happy Resurrection Day. Isn't it good to be here and celebrate with God's people this special, special day? Um, keep your Bible open there to John chapter 20. That's where we'll be this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you again for the resurrection of Jesus, and we pray that you would help us this morning to be believers in this event. And we also ask that you would show us how this event changes our lives, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever heard someone say, seeing is believing? Seeing is believing. You know, if I see it, then I'll believe it. If I see it with my own eyes, then I'll know that it's happened. Uh, you know, we, we live in a world where um, we rely upon science, and if science proves it, then it must be true. And we, none of us want to be gullible. None of us want to be, you know, caught out to be a fool. Um, you know, we, we hate it. W what a big stink gets made when, when things get photoshopped. 
um, poor Kate and her family picture, hey? What a big uproar that caused when that picture was photoshopped. No, we, we hate things like that. We need video evidence. I need to see it for myself. None of us believe in fairies or unicorns or genies or mermaids or zombies or yaoi's or bunyips. Drop bears, maybe. But none of the other stuff. We like to think those things are true, um, but we don't believe them because we haven't seen them. Um, we're told to have an inquiring mind. Don't be so gullible. Seeing is believing. And you love it when you see things from your, for yourself. You love this. You don't know this about yourself, but you love seeing things for yourself. I want, I want to show you a picture here. Now, have a look at this picture and um, just look at it for a moment. Put up your hand if you see Marilyn Monroe. Put up your hand if you see Einstein. All right, hands down. Put up your hand if you see both. Put up your hand if you see neither. All right, very good. Um, no one needs glasses, although I'm told, that I'm, I don't know which one, but if you see one and not the other, um, I can't remember which one it is, but you need glasses. It's okay, don't worry. Um, how, did you f how do you feel knowing that there, if you see one and not the other, how, did you, how do you feel knowing there's another person in this picture that you can't see? How do you feel about that? My guess is you feel a bit left out. You feel as though, oh, I wish I could see that. I can't see that, but I wish I could. See, the desire to see is in all of us. Everyone's checking now with glasses to see <laughs> if you can see. But see, that just proves the point, doesn't it? <laughs> you want to see. We all want to see. That desire is in all of us. Now, this morning, you can Google that later and check it out for yourself. Now, this morning, we are celebrating an event that none of us have seen. None of us were there to see to actually eyeball the risen Lord Jesus. None of us saw him walk out of that tomb. I wasn't there to see him come back to life again. You weren't there to see him come back to life again. So the question is, why should I believe this? Why should you believe this? Thankfully, we have an account written in one of the um, accounts of Jesus' life, which is recorded for us, which tells us one of the main followers of Jesus doubted that it happened because he wasn't there. He thought seeing is believing. So if you're here this morning and you're a skeptic, a doubter, a, an inquirer, you've come to the right place. We want you to meet Jesus. And uh, Jesus has something to say to people like you who might be doubting and have good questions. Um, we don't want you to be gullible. We don't want you to have blind faith. It, it, faith has, um, comes with answers. And so what this text shows us is three things about believing. It shows us that seeing is believing, first of all. But it also shows you that you can be believing without seeing, second of all. And then finally, I want us to consider that you can believe in this resurrection event. All right? Seeing is believing. There's believing without seeing, and you can also believe. So first Seeing is believing. Let's look at things from the point of view of the disciples here, first of all. It's Easter Sunday night. Um, the ten disciples are gathered in the upper room. They've locked themselves inside. Thomas is missing. Remember, their leader has just been killed, and they're thinking, we might be next. They're terrified. They're quivering with fear. And what's even more weirder is that they've just heard from Mary that Mary has come with the news that Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. He's alive that very morning. What's going on? Look at verse 19. John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Do you see, all of a sudden, in that locked room, Jesus appears. 
out of nowhere. And he shows them the nail holes where the nails were driven into his hands. He shows them his side where the spear was plunged in by the soldiers. He's in the same body that got nailed and speared. They're not seeing a ghost. They're seeing the body of Jesus come back to life. And it's a transformed body. This body just appears out of nowhere in the middle of the room. Now, for, then, for these ten disciples, what's their reaction? They're overjoyed. For them, seeing results in believing. Seeing is believing. They're overjoyed. They see the evidence. They see all the na nail prints. They see the spear hole. And they're, they're over the moon. Now, friends, this is one thing you need to understand about Christianity, which is so different to every other religion. Christianity depends upon historical evidence. Christianity is dependent upon the historical evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. And what that means is people had to see it. The way history works is people have to see it to record it. Um, th this doesn't work if no one saw this event happen. See, for them, it's essential for them to see. Seeing is believing. And then the risen Jesus tells them these words, verse 21. And Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, what we're seeing here is that this event, this resurrection, makes a big difference in their life. And I'm telling you, this event, will, if you believe it, will make a big difference in your life as well. It, it really matters that this happened. See, the, the risen Jesus gives them a divine commission uh, he gives these apostles, these sent ones, the privilege of saying to people, to anyone who trusts in Jesus, they can say, your sins are forgiven. You can have peace with God. That's the message of the gospel, by the way. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have peace with God. You can have all those things that are counted against you, God can take them away and you can enjoy peace with him. You know what it's like, don't you, when someone doesn't forgive you. Have you ever, have you ever done something to someone and they don't talk to you? I know of two cousins who one person said something badly to the other cousin and the, and the other cousin didn't talk to this cousin for about five years. Okay, five years is a long time to not talk to somebody. And the, the first cousin was just so upset, she couldn't sleep at night. She was really um, wounded that the words that she said had caused so much hurt. There's not even an opportunity to apologize. That's how hard it is. And some of you know this pain as well from family members. It, it's hurtful. But can you, can you just imagine for a minute what it's like to wake up one day and realize that you, you yourself have offended the living God by your words, by your actions, by your attitude. That you've said things, done things, thought things that have offended him and, and he's angry with you. And the relationship between you is broken. You'd want to know about that, wouldn't you? Now, what if this same God sent someone from heaven down to earth who died and came back to life and he came to you with a message that said all the things that you've done wrong they can be forgiven <laughs> you can have peace with this god wow that's a message you'd want to hear uh, that's a message you'd want to grab hold of and take for yourself friends that's the christian message that all your offenses all the things you've done wrong Jesus can forgive them. He can wipe them out. You can start with a sl clean slate. Do you see this? The fact that Jesus rose from the dead, it actually makes a big difference in your life. You know, some people think that Neil Armstrong 
um, didn't land on the moon, that the whole event was filmed in the, in the back lot of a Hollywood studio somewhere um, to convince the world that the Americans were first on the moon, whatever, you know. Um, I, let me tell you this. It doesn't um, keep me awake at night when I look at the moon and, you know, I don't look at the moon and think, um, I'm so glad the Americans were there first. <laughs> that doesn't keep me awake at night, all right? Um, it doesn't, the fact that Neil Armstrong landed on the moon doesn't change my life, but this event does change my life. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead makes a huge difference in your life. I mean, some people think about the resurrection of Jesus and they think it's a big hoax. They think it's a big joke. Um, they think that the myth just got bigger and bigger and, and the, the whole event didn't happen. But I want you to think about something. When you look at what Jesus Christ is offering you this morning, it does make a big difference in your life. Okay, Whether or not this event is true, it really does matter. You can sleep tonight with a clear conscience between you and God because of this event. And you can have the kind of hope that Christians have that just keep you going in life. Um, but what, what I want you to see is that this event, it depends upon people seeing it. Seeing is believing. That's what we discover when we look at this event from the point of view of the disciples. But is that the only way of believing something? Do you have to see something in order to believe it? I want us to think about the next point now, believing without seeing. Because that's what this guy Thomas teaches us. Doubting Thomas, he's often referred to for better or worse. But remember that Thomas isn't there. He's not there when Jesus appears to these uh, 10 disciples. Look at verse 25 when Thomas does appear. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Um, now, in the original, the, the, the sense of this is they, they keep telling him, we've seen the Lord. Thomas, we've seen the Lord. We've seen the Lord. They keep persuading him. Remember, there's 10 of them there. There's 10 people trying to persuade one person that they've seen the Lord, right? The odds are against Thomas. Um, he's the odd one out. Um, He's the only guy that doesn't get a visual of the resurrection. He's, Thomas is kind of in the same situation we're in in many ways. He hears the eyewitness testimony of the apostles that Jesus is alive. That's the situation we're in today. We've heard the eyewitness testimony of the apostles that Jesus is alive. Thomas wasn't there. We weren't there. We just have the word of the apostles. Now, what's Thomas's reaction? What does Thomas say? Does he say like Job, Oh yes, I know that my Redeemer lives, and after my flesh has been destroyed, after my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh I will see God. No, he doesn't say that, does he? Look at his words in verse 25. He said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. In fact, in the original, it's a double negative. He's, he's emphatic. He's saying, what he's saying is, I definitely won't believe it. I definitely won't believe it. Do you, do you see what his problem is? His problem is not that he can't believe. You know what his problem is? His problem is he will not believe. He's choosing not to believe. See, the problem with Thomas is not his inability to believe. The problem with, with Thomas is that he's not willing to believe. Um, you know, some people don't believe because they just refuse to believe. They've already decided things themselves without examining the evidence. They, they come with their own conditions. That's what Thomas is doing. He, he's got his own conditions. Thomas says, I'll only believe if I get to stick my finger into the hole where the nail went in. I'll only believe if I get to put my hand in his side where the spear was driven in. Then I'll believe. And maybe this morning you've come to Jesus with your conditions. 
I once met a guy who told me that the reason he stopped believing was that God um, wasn't answering his prayers. He thought, I'm not going to be a believer anymore because God's not answering my prayers. Now, what's his condition? What is it? Answered prayer. Okay, he's put a condition upon God for his belief. I um, Sadly, I know a, a, of a woman um, whose husband died. And they were praying and praying and praying for him to get better, but he died. And uh, to this day, this woman is now not a believer because of that event. Very sad, very tragic. I don't want to undermine that. But do you see, even with that sad event, she's put a condition upon her belief. The condition is an alive husband. Now, let me ask you, have you come this morning with your conditions for believing? Do you have your own personal list of conditions that you say to God, only if this happens, then I will believe. Now, I'm not talking about doubts. All of us at times have doubts, and I, and I hope you get to work through your doubts because there are answers. But if you've got the kind of heart that says, I'm refu refusing to believe unless this happens, well, that's a different story. See, for Thomas, he has to eyeball the resurrected body of Jesus to believe it. Now, is that what you think? Do you really believe that you have to see something in order to believe it? Do you have to see something with your own eyes? Is that how you operate in life? You have to see something for you to know that it's true. Um, let me illustrate this point for you. Um, who here thinks that the earth is round? Just put your hand up. Um, who here thinks that the earth is flat? Okay, we have two. Sorry, one. And I think he's joking. But, but let, those of you who think the earth is round, how do you know? Has anyone here ever been up in space and actually seen the earth um, as a globe from the safety of a space shuttle? Anyone? No. Why do you think the earth is round? Do you know why you think it's round? Because you've seen pictures of it. You've seen pictures um, that have been sent from people who have been in a spaceship and, and sent them back to show us that the earth is round. How do you know those pictures aren't photoshopped? How do you know that? Um, there's actually a group of people who do believe the earth is not round but flat there's a facebook group called the flat earth society this facebook group says we have members from all around the globe <laughs> have a think about that but do you really think seeing is believing of course you don't you don't you don't operate that way you rely upon eyewitness testimony. That's why you believe the earth is round, because others have seen that it's round. Others have done the experiments to demonstrate that it's round. You haven't done the experiments. You're relying upon their eyewitness testimony. None of us have seen World War I. None of us have witnessed gravity waves. None of us have seen an atom. None of us have seen black holes. But we all believe in these things because of others who have told us that these things have happened or these things exist. You and I rely upon the testimony of people. In fact, you know, the person who lives by seeing is believing, who says, I don't even believe in the experiences of others. Well, I'm sorry, that's the person who doesn't believe in anything. It's a very sad way to live. But notice what happens next. Verse 26. Verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Do you notice a whole week goes past? Thomas is living for a whole week thinking that Jesus is dead. 
Just let that sink in for a moment. He's not believing because of his own conditions. And then when Jesus appears, Jesus, oh, look at his reaction. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. I love how gentle Jesus is with Thomas. Oh, he meets him in his conditions. He doesn't go in and scold him and rebuke him. No, he says, Thomas, take a look. It's really me. And if you have conditions this morning, Jesus can meet you in your conditions if you'll let him. Um, but Jesus actually does rebuke him for not believing. He says, stop doubting and believe. Literally, don't be an unbeliever. Be a believer. He's saying to Thomas, Thomas, you're on your way to becoming an unbeliever. You need to be a believer. I want you to believe. He's rebuking him for doubting the testimony of the apostles. He should have believed them. He didn't need to see in order to believe. Seeing is not believing. And as a, as a believer, he doesn't need to see the resurrection to believe it. And as a believer, you don't need to see the resurrection in order to believe it. Um, you don't need to see a risen Christ in order to believe in him. Now, something can be true, whether or not you're there to see it. Ah, but Jesus is so gracious to Thomas. You know, Thomas gets to see that which we don't get to see. Thomas has the privilege of eyeballing and touching the risen Jesus. Why does Thomas get such special treatment? You ever thought about that? Why does Thomas get treated in this way? Well, look back in verse 24, and it's hinted at here. Verse 24 says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve. One of the twelve. He's one of the twelve. You know what that means? He's an apostle. He's one of the guys who gets to see the risen Lord Jesus. Why? So that he can go and tell others. Just look at these, um, look at these words from Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Um, this is when they chose another apostle to replace Judas. And we read this. Therefore, it was necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us, that's the other apostles, the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So, do you see, when they chose another apostle to replace Judas, they chose someone who had been with them the whole time, someone who had actually seen the risen Lord Jesus. Why? So that he could become a witness as well of the resurrection. So he could testify that this event happened. So as a believer, Thomas doesn't need to see the resurrection. Ah, but as an apostle, that's a different story. It's essential that he sees the resurrection so that he can testify about it. And of course, tradition has it that um, Thomas is the guy who went as far away to India to share the gospel with people. So it's because of Thomas's eyewitness testimony that many Indians have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Thomas, rebuked as an unbeliever, but blessed as an apostle. He got to see what we haven't. He got special treat treatment so others can know um, what he saw. Um, now, I have no doubt that John recorded this event for us because of the words that Thomas speaks next. Thomas responds um, with what I think is probably one of the most undoubting expressions of faith in Jesus in the Bible. Look at verse 28. Verse 28 says, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. See, the penny dropped. He got it. Jesus, you're my Lord. 
You're my God. I give every ounce of myself to you. That's what he's saying. My Lord and my God. You're my master and you're divine. Wow, what an expression of faith. Friends, can you see Christianity depends on truth? There's a Netflix um, show where uh, uh, Dave Letterman interviews, and on one of the episodes, Dave interviews Obama, um, one of the previous presidents of the United States. And in the interview, Obama talks about a debate between an American senator and another guy who's a bit less capable at debating. And during the debate, the less capable guy gets all flustered during this debate when he's debating this senator. And he says to the senator, well, senator, that's just your opinion and I have mine. And the senator says back to this guy, sir, you are, you are entitled to your opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own fa facts. And that's so true, isn't it? Especially when it comes to the resurrection. You might be here today and you think, oh, that definitely didn't happen. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're not entitled to your facts. And John is showing us that the important thing about Christianity is that it's based on facts. People saw the facts. People saw the evidence. But you don't need to see them in order for it to be true. If these events didn't happen, then we should just, you know, pack up shop and go home right now. We're wasting our time here right now this morning. But if these events happened and people saw it and reported it, then you've got to believe it. And that's why what Jesus says is so important. Verse 29, Then Jesus told them, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, we're standing here in this, sitting here in this room, and we're actually more blessed than Thomas. Isn't that wonderful? We're more blessed than Thomas if we will listen to those who have seen these events. We're blessed if we believe them. And John is showing us that even the spokesperson for Christianity had his doubts. And when we look at things from Thomas's point of view, we can see that there is, it's possible to see, sorry, it's possible to believe without seeing. Now, finally, I want to just finish by showing you that you can also believe. And now let's look at this from the perspective of John. We've seen it from the perspective of the disciples, then Thomas. Now look what John says, the, the gospel writer, verse 30. He says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Why are these events, why is this event written for us here today in 2024? It's written so that you can believe. See, John writes this book, he records th this event, he writes these words so that you can believe and by believing so that you can have eternal life. See, John's writing this not just so you think, oh, wow, that's a cool story. Wow, that's really, you know, piqued my interest and that'll be a great discussion at book club next week or whatever. No, it's... It's interesting, but it's more than interesting. It's essential to know these things so that you can have eternal life. Let me finish just by asking you, what difference does the resurrection make in your life here today? If you believe in the resurrection, how does it change your life right now? Let me just tell you one area it can change your life. How do you handle death? How do you handle death? Maybe your own death might be coming. Maybe the death of someone else that you love. Maybe death as you've watched you know, people get older and older and that saddens you. 
Maybe you've just been to too many funerals. Um, I'm a minister. I've taken about 34 funerals now for, for about 40 people. Um, and uh, it's really struck me as I've taken funerals that there are three different types of people at funerals usually. There are, there are people who are there and they have no idea what's going on. And um, they, uh, they're, they're the ones who usually cry the loudest at a funeral. Um, there are those who um, are there and they think they will see the dead person again, um, but they really don't know what's going to happen. Um, but there's a third kind of person at a funeral, and it's the kind of person who knows they will see the dead person again because they believe in the resurrection. They miss them and they're sad, but through the tears, they have joy because they know that resurrection means there's a reunion coming. And that's one of the, just one of the areas where believing this makes a difference in your life, um, it, where it changes you. But look, don't take it from me. I wasn't there. Take it from John, the guy who wrote this. He was there, stop doubting, and believe. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can be sure that this event happened because you have allowed so many men and women to see this event with their own eyes. And that's been recorded for us so that we can know with, with certainty that the, this event happened. So Father, um, help us with our doubts. Help us to come to you with our doubts. I pray that you'd meet us in our doubts. But Father, we pray you'd take away that refusal that we might have to believe. And we thank you that this resurrection changes our life and may it continue to give us hope and joy. In Jesus' name, amen.